Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first Executive Leadership Breakfast for the academic year 2009-2010. I am Marcia Keyes, president of York College, and I'm really delighted that Mr. Joseph Ficalora, chairman, president, and CEO of the New York Community Bank Corp, Inc., was able to make good on his commitment made earlier this year, sometime in January, to plug us in, in between his many trips to Europe, to Zurich, to Frankfurt, to London, to Paris, and what did I leave out? Milan. Milan. <laughs> and here you are in Jamaica, Queens. Let's welcome him. <laughs> You know, it's been a very interesting year. Um, some people wouldn't use that word. But here at York, we are continuing to experiencing some high highs. And just yesterday, in this very room, we spent some time with different people talking about the launch of our three new schools, our School of Health and Behavioral Sciences, our School of Business and Information Systems, and our School of Arts and Sciences. And in launching those three schools, we took the opportunity to invite Dr. Muriel Howard, who is the president of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, to come speak to us. And she was an apt speaker, because not only was she president of a large university in New York, in Buffalo, for 13 years, but she also spent some 23 years in another large university, also in Buffalo, in the state system, and another 23 years there. And now, she also is leading this institution, but the qualification, really, and the bonus for us was that she was a child, if you will, of Jamaica, Queens, and Southeast Queens. And so the comments she made resonated wonderfully for us as an institution born around the same time that she was growing up and with students who have benefited from the growth that York has wrought. It was five years ago, too, that we started this breakfast series. And I want to thank my good friends at Arts and Company, Jane and Fred and George, for giving us the idea. And over those years, we started with Larry Mandel and Greg Meeks, post-Katrina, to talk about disasters and disaster preparedness. And we've had a series of opinion makers, including Chris Ward, David Nealman, city council speaker, Christine Quinn, and others who have come to York to use this as a platform to lay out new ideas. And we have been delighted to welcome them. And so we continue the tradition today. But I'd like to acknowledge those, not only those who have come to speak, but those who have come to listen and to question. And that's you, our very loyal audience. I want to applaud you and thank you for your support. Let me thank a few people who have been there for us and some who are in the room. Our corporate sponsor today is JetBlue. I don't see Isima yet, but I know that she's always there for us. 
Uh, thank you very much for the partnership with our Aviation Institute. I don't see Carlos Flynn. I gathered he was coming. He's a very loyal supporter of us from the university. Our alums are always here to support us. Among them, Wayne Hall, Ajwa Gaziva, Tracy Bowes. I don't see George Grasso today. Uh, he doesn't have to show up at anything because he sent us two students, his son and his, his niece. <laughs> So if he's not here, we forgive him. Uh, I also, of course, see Pat McCrell and one of our very new, where is Dave? He's someplace. Where are you? Uh, yes, OK, one of our very new alums. And I'm so glad to see you with us. Uh, Councilman White will be coming to do the introductions, but we also have Councilman Leroy Comrie. Thank you for your support, Leroy. Our stalwart supporter, Claire Schulman, member of our foundation board. George Aridas and others at this table, also our foundation board members and our advisory board members. And Doris, you serve a num wear a number of hats here. Doris and of course, Reverend Norris, who have been such great supporters of ours, and Jackie Arrington, Mr. Jefferson, and others. I also want to acknowledge the very strong support we have gotten from our Tuskegee Airmen, represented here today by Airman Freeman. Your support to our students in the Aviation Institute and the Aviation Program is priceless to us. And indeed, we continue to honor what you did for our nation and want to thank you for being there. As I mentioned, we've started the year with a bang, and I just want to mention a few things that have happened here at York uh, starting in September. Along with the launching of our three new schools, we hosted our annual York Fest in early September. It is our open house to the community featuring music, children's activities, and engagement of our faculty with the community. On that same night, on that same Saturday night, we kicked off our performing arts series with the Latin Giants Band. Edwige Dandicat, MacArthur Fellow, read from her work in September for our students in our small theater. Bob Parmet, our very own professor of history at York, gave a powerful lecture on the history of York College. And by the way, those of you who missed it can go to YouTube, YouTube York College, and you will see that powerful lecture. Majora Carter, also a MacArthur Fellow, and sustainability guru from the Bronx, accepted an honorary doctorate and addressed our fall convocation. And this very evening, our students will open a five-day run of the play Fabulation and the Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, Lynn Nottage, will be on campus to lead a talk back. And I have not touched, ladies and gentlemen, and what is going on in terms of academic outcomes, student scholarships, research, our faculty's increased productivity in scholarship, in grant writing and grant getting, the work of our phenomenal continuing education program, our small business development center, our new tennis team. Who knew we had a new tennis team? who is uh, just out there. Again, if you look at our website, you'll see what we're doing. Our year-long strategic planning, and many in this room can testify to the fact that we're active in visioning to the year 2020, and we are also planning a new master plan. So you see, Mr. Ficolora, you have come to speak with us on a topic as you know, that is still timely. 
to a college, York College, that is vibrant and engaged. And so I'd like to ask, I don't think Councilman White is here yet. Uh, he was going to do the formal introductions. I'm going to ask if I could, Councilman Comrie, if he might pinch hit uh, for us, because I know that he is always ready and you know Joe well, right? And so, Councilman, thank you so much for doing the honors. Okay. Okay, I'm glad I had a cup of coffee this morning. <laughs> good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you here at the York College Lecture Series. I must say that um, it has been an impressive list of speakers that have come to impart their wisdom and knowledge and professionalism. And clearly, we are continuing in that tradition today um, with Mr. Joseph Ficarella, who is going to be the speaker today. Uh, I'm not going to insult everybody with reading his bio. I'm sure you all know how to read. Um, and, but I will tell you that he is a major player in this community. Um, if you look at the bottom of his bio, he has been involved in most of the major institutions in the Queens community. And he was involved in them at a time when they were all growing and developing. The Queens Museum of Art is just beginning their capital construction project, which Mr. Ficarello was a major part of when he was on the board. Um, and he's moved on from there because now they have their money to do their capital project. There's a theme to this. The, the, the Queens Museum of Art, which is also a major involved in a major capital project, he was on the board. And those are the boards that he's left to go and work on other areas to help them as they're working to do major tasks in the community. So he has a commitment to Queens, not just from a banking aspect, but understanding that Queens is the best borough to live. And that we deserve to have our arts and culture and entertainment and, and nightlife second to none because we have such a diverse borough and we have such a diverse economy to tap into it and to expand our facilities in the tradition of our former borough president um, who worked to expand facilities all over the borough and hopefully in the tradition of the next city council and the present city council where we've worked also to expand, but we can't do it without people like Joseph Ficarella, who is dedicated to put time into this community, to work on boards, to go to meetings, beyond his uh, um, role as a banker, as a person that can find opportunities to fund these programs. So I'm really thankful for him, to, to, for his role in this community. I'm thankful for him for his role throughout Queens, and I'm thankful that he's here today to share his expertise here at York College. So without further ado, let's bring up our guest speaker, Mr. Joseph Ficarella. Good morning, all. Good morning. Thank you for your kind words. Obviously, uh, I'm very pleased to hear that this is a, a new undertaking, or relatively new undertaking, for York. And uh, I sus suspect that um, the new York College breakfast would work out very nicely with the pin that I'm wearing today. <laughs> so for, for all of you, I, I think I'm going to suggest that uh, the topic which has to do with our economy and banking in general is not necessarily going to be a story that has uh, great news for us all, but it is a story that we need to address frankly and openly, and it would be wise, I think, for us all to be aware that uh, this is not a uh, new occurrence. This is an evolving situation that has a uh, long future life. And I guess I begin by saying that uh, all cycles and the economic cycles that we go through are inevitable. And the consequence of a positive cycle is a following negative cycle. All cycles reflect the cycle that precedes them. So we've come through the longest, most positive cycle probably in the history of this nation. So running from, depending on where you were, uh, 92, 93, through 2005, 2006, 2007, we had a robust, positive cycle creating the greatest wealth in the history of the nation for that matter, in the history of the world. The distribution of wealth around the world 
was in fact a component of this robust positive cycle. Now we're in the negative component of the cycle evolution, and this likewise will be a long and difficult cycle. That should not be a surprise to people. People should not expect uh, unreasonable uh, ways in which you can end a cycle. There needs to be adjustment during each cycle. Uh, the good news about a negative cycle is that it will be followed by a positive cycle. The bad news is that we have years in front of us of unfortunate great difficulty. Because in many cases the excesses represent valuations that need to adjust down. So I'm sure you're all aware that the U.S. economy has been plagued by a downturn in jobs or a loss of economic vitality. That is inevitable in a cycle, but in this particular cycle, the speed with which change occurred is significantly greater than in many other cycles. When you take great volumes of dollars out of the economy, you cause loss of jobs. You cause loss of businesses, businesses close. You cause disruptions that are painful. Inevitably, in this cycle already, as Greenspan said earlier this year, from 2007 to the beginning of this year, world wealth decreased by $40 trillion. That number is much larger today. $40 trillion. He marked total world wealth remaining at 80 plus trillion dollars. That is a major change. The consequence of change such as that is going to be an adjustment in the overall economy for a period of time. So you have the credit components as well as the reality that massive amounts of wealth have already been lost. Now, you think about, well, what is the relevance of wealth? Wealth, the reason the economy kept expanding, was driven by the reality that there was funding available for appreciated values. Those appreciated values were principally in two places. All other things tie into these two places. The appreciated values in real estate, all types, and the appreciated values in businesses or their market caps as they traded in the equity markets. So the equity markets represent a major component. But I'm sure you're all aware that both of those components of the economy are subject to change on a very rapid pace. So when you have huge amounts of value leave the market rapidly, people, and businesses are run by people, and households are run by people, people make judgments. It's easy to see if you lose your job that you're not gonna be spending much money. But if you have your job, and all of your friends are in fact losing their job or otherwise changing their decisions, and your fears are, are compounded by the reality that you were going to get a home equity loan to buy your car, and you find out that your home is worth less than your existing outstanding debt, or you were going to make a decision to improve your house, but you don't have the money available to do that, and you can't get a new mortgage, and you realize that the value of your expected retirement fund, your 401k, has been greatly reduced, you change how you make your decisions and you spend less and you save more. That is reality. The American people were saving less than at any time in history coming into this cycle. The American people are now saving more money well, that's good because individuals, corporations, they need more money in the bank or available to deal with future adversity. But that's bad for the economy. Why? Because the economy can only expand if money is being spent. So 
in the simplest of terms, we are in a period of time during which there is going to be fewer jobs. We're in a period of time during which businesses that were vibrant three years ago will go out of business. We're in a period of time when new businesses will not arise because there is no funding for the new business. This is a unfortunate reality that we need to grasp. And then the decision makers that need to deal with the reality need to make decisions that will increase the likelihood of positive change, reinvestment into the economy. The, the need for the next buyer, the person who will buy the house down the street, the need for the viability of the next buyer cannot be missed. Because without a buyer, you don't have an appreciating value in housing. And, and contemplating that, let's just say, three years ago, a person could buy a house with no money down, outstanding debts, in excess of their available funding, their, their revenue streams, could buy a house when, in fact, the house was worth $100,000 more than it had been worth two years earlier. And now today, a person could buy that same house, which is worth $100,000 less, but they have to put down 20% or 25%. The number of people that have accumulated a sufficient amount of money to buy a house, that's fewer. The FICO scores, the qualifications to buy a house, are higher. That means that the number of people who will meet the standards required to buy a house are fewer. So when you take the numbers and you look at them, there is a consequence to imbalance. When you have more buyers than sellers, values go up. When you have more sellers than buyers, values come down. Inevitably, for a period of time in front of us, we are going to have more sellers than buyers. And unless we change that balance, by creating more eligible buyers, either systemically or otherwise, there is going to be a protracted period during which the value of housing will come down. That is not insignificant, because the value of housing, remember, is a major component of the appreciated values that are used to grow the economy. Broadly, if you have appreciation, and remember, appreciation isn't the money deposited in your bank, it's the perception of value. So the appreciation of housing or the appreciation of a building, commercial buildings, commercial buildings here in New York City, great deal of discussion about the shoe which is yet to drop. Great deal of discussion about the reality that New York City is doing far better than many places around the country. Many places that had massive appreciation, new construction in Nevada, in Arizona, in Miami, in many areas of California, that appreciation has gone through massive depreciation. The values on brand new housing in some markets have gone down 40, 50, 60, 65 percent. That's a lot of money to lose if, in fact, you own the house. In many of these cases, they were brand new houses. So the money was first lost by the builder and ultimately lost by the banker and ultimately sold into the market or available to the market at deep discount. The normal process is that, that when real estate is discounted, ultimately people are able to buy because the pricing is lower and they can buy, not because interest rates are lower, because they are. Interest rates are at historical lows, meaning that the cost of carrying of debt is extremely favorable to buyers. That's one of the positive things that has been done by the Fed. However, 
The bad news is that even though the Fed is keeping rates extremely low, and, and obviously if you have a CD, you're not happy about where rates are, but there's a balance between the two. The reality is that by keeping rates lower, you increase qualification because the amount of money necessary to get the loan is less. So your ability to pay the loan is better. So the eligibility is increased. But remember, that's going against the reality that you have higher requirements in down payment. You have higher expectations with regard to your ability to pay. Your qualifications as a person given the loan have been increased. So there are people today that have loans on their home. If they went to refinance their home, they couldn't get a loan. If they went to buy another home, they won't get a loan. And, and they don't even know that. There are many, many broken deals in the market today because the buyer who thought they were fine, when they started looking for a house, they went to see their banker eight months ago, they thought they were fine. They find the house, they go back to see their banker, and their banker says, I'm sorry. You know, the new rules, you don't qualify. So in some cases, there are people selling their house for the fourth time at a lower price each time to a different person each time because the deal broke. Not a good thing. Not a good thing to have many houses on the same block that are going to be sold into the market at discount. There are new rules. We have actually on the books of the United States laws, recently written laws that break the law. And they say, what are you talking about? We've actually written law that says if you have a contract, we in fact will break that contract as the Congress has the power to do so. And the Congress has actually gone to the point where they have said these are the circumstances under which we will break the law. Now, who are the people that are going to be burdened by the change in law? Well, in many cases, one of the main problems we had over the last five years was an unlevel playing field. An unlevel playing field wherein there were regulated lenders who were, in fact, following reasonable guidelines and, in many cases, taking risk. When a bank lends a person 90% of the value of a house, the bank has his money at risk for 90% of the value of the house. The person has 10% of the value of the house at risk. So if a bank is portfolioing the loan, the bank has a very, very, very good reason to expect that the house is worth what they've determined and that the individual has the ability to make the payment. Because if the individual doesn't make the payment, it is very costly to the bank. Now, the bank is not using the government's money. The bank is using your money because it uses the money of its depositors to lend. And the reality is when the situation turns and the bank is at greater risk for having created a bad loan, the bank loses some of the depositors' money. I'm sure you're all aware that there are banks all over this country that are going out of business. And they're going out of business because in many cases, they have loans that have lost more money than they have capital to carry. It's never a good thing when a bank goes out of business. In the last cycle, many, many banks. Here in New York, we lost Bowery, American, Greater, Dollar, Dry Dock. Many banks that have been around 100 plus years did not survive the last credit cycle turn. That downturn from 87 to 92 was five years. In 1986, the valuation of housing on an inflation adjusted basis hit the highest levels in history. And by 87, those values were coming down. And for each of those years that followed, those values came down. And one by one, banks went out of business in many places. 
By 2003, the values of 1986 were exceeded. So the appreciated value of housing was higher in 2003 than at any other time in history, only to be exceeded by the values of 2004, then to be exceeded by the values of 2005, and in some markets to be exceeded in six, although there was a slowing and a change. There are markets in this country wherein values in this downturning cycle have not gone down. And the reason they haven't gone down is because over the preceding decade, they were going down. They weren't going up. There is no adjustment to values that have been depreciating during an upturning positive credit cycle. So if you're in Cleveland or in certain markets in Buffalo or in certain markets in Detroit, the value of housing in Detroit's gone down dramatically because even though it never really went up without jobs, there's a serious downward pressure on the value of housing. When in fact headlines were telling us all that we had a serious problem, the fact is that we only had a problem in 18 states. That meant that 32 states had values that were the same or higher. 32 states were the same or higher for much of the period which has just ended 18 months or so. That means only in 18 states, values had dropped off dramatically. And in some of those states, values dropped off significantly. So when, when you think about it, there's always imbalance. But here we are in New York City. So what is going to happen in New York City? In New York City, the largest losses are going to come in commercial assets, in multifamily buildings, in assets that heretofore have had decreased rentals. Rentals are way down. Sales are way down. Sales. Sales of large real estate properties in New York City represent massive revenue loss for the city, for the state, Go to a county. Every single entity that, in fact, raises taxes, gets the money that it needs to spend, gets the money from the economy. So a robust real estate market presents a lot of tax revenue. Bonuses, income, presents a lot of tax revenue. Both of those large components are down and are likely to be down for a period of time. Consequence, every government entity that is dependent upon tax revenues is going to have massive loss of jobs, massive loss of, of the ability to spend money because they'll have less money. The only government entity that can spend money it doesn't have is the federal government. Now, there are limits even there. And the world is recognizing that we are beyond our limits. And if we do this too long, to too far of a degree, the value of our dollar will come down. Now contemplate that the relationship of the dollar to the rest of the world is, is an important component of the quality of life in the United States of America. We've gone from being a massive producer of assets to being a massive user of assets. We are a consuming nation, not a producing nation. We buy from the rest of the world fuel. We buy from the rest of the world cars. We buy from the rest of the world televisions. We buy from the rest of the world many of the things that we want. And for a long period of time, we're able to buy those things at very, very cheap prices compared to the ability for other people in the world to buy the same products. And the reason we're able to buy them at better pricing is because our dollar is worth more than their currencies. So as you change the value of the dollar, we will get lower quality products. It will be more expensive ultimately for us to buy many of the things that we need. The concept that by changing the value of the dollar, we'll be able to sell more to the world is flawed. It's not gonna happen. In many ways, the things that we need are produced cheaper than we can produce them 
the differentials are so wide that the dollar isn't the reason why we're able to buy from China or from other places in the world products that are cheaper. They don't have the same government guidelines. They don't have the same rules. They don't have the same accounting. They, in fact, pay the producer of the product much less than we do. Change the value of the dollar, it doesn't make us, on a level playing field, competitive. So at the end of the day, over a course of time, the devaluation of the dollar is not a good thing. It's a bad thing. That is actually inflationary. In order for us to buy most of the things that we need, we, in fact, will have to use more dollars. Now, the problem, China holds huge, huge reserves of dollars, as, as does most of the rest of the world. We go through a negative cycle where, in fact, the values of the very assets in the United States go down. We become a bargain. In many respects, New York City will be a beneficiary of decreased value in dollars and a willingness of very wealthy nations, people, businesses to invest in New York City. So over the course of the period in front of us, there will be an opportunity for new money to be invested in New York. That's actually a good thing. Because if you don't have support of any market, the market deteriorates. It is better to have foreign investment in New York City than it is to have no investment in New York City. But having said that, this is a college. Young people are anxiously preparing to come into the economy which is evolving in front of us. You want a robust, growing economy because that's how you, in fact, will feed your children. We need to do whatever we can do to create a better likelihood that the period in front of us will be an improving period. We need to accept the reality that there are going to be many, many, many difficulties for a long period of time in front of us, and we're gonna need to deal with those difficulties in a prudent way that makes it more likely that the adversity will be shorter and less damaging. Because if we don't make the big decisions to do the right thing, we will just spiral. This is not the way you like to start your day. This is not a pleasant thought. But sometimes you have to open both eyes and realize that this is not a, a classroom discussion. Let's, let's talk about the classroom. This is a different topic, but the same topic. We have decision makers in this country that have decided that in a purest way, the accounting rules of the past need to be adjusted for their perception of where we are today and where we're going tomorrow. So I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard of fair value accounting. Fair value accounting is an accounting rule that suggests that we're going to take what is normally a method by which stability is created and in the alternative create visibility. And you think about that and you say, well, geez, don't we need stability going into a crisis period? No. The accountants believe we need visibility going into this period. Now, what is that trade-off? The trade-off is an accelerated, exaggerated loss. Now, think about what that means to an ongoing business when, in fact, you're taking hundreds of billions of dollars of value off a balance sheet through an income statement quarter by quarter. That's every 90 days. Every 90 days, you're revaluing the assets, for example, of a lender. Now, although they do not mark-to-market mortgages today, they mark-to-market mortgage-backed securities today. The underlying asset is a house. It could be your house. The underlying asset 
is actually, it was a AAA piece of paper in an endowment fund, in a pension fund, in a hospital, assets that were held all over the world. Those assets were revalued every 90 days on the tradability of that asset. What would someone be willing to pay to own that asset? What does that do? In a downturning credit cycle, that causes massive devaluation of the asset because the next buyer has to contemplate if the intrinsic value of this asset is 80, if the housing that's underlying this asset is 80, but the market value of this asset is 60, do I really want to buy the asset at 60 when I know that when it's in my portfolio, in 90 days, I'm subject to the next reassessment of the value of this asset. So by example, and this is all public, by example, when Citibank marked a particular class of assets in June of 08 to 56, 55, they were mortified to find that Merrill Lynch marked the same assets by sale. They sold the assets into the street at 22. They realized six. Now, of course, the assets were not worth 22 or six, but that was the accounting. The consequence to city was, not only did they write off everything that they had to write off to get to 55, within three months, they had massive additional write-offs on the same assets, or they sold them. Because if accounting rules devalue assets, there's a point at which the holder of the asset decides, I'll take the burden today because I fear the burden tomorrow will be worse. That causes devaluation of the asset. Those massive losses go against capital. So in 2007, everyone recognized that the US financial markets had more capital than at any other cycle turn that had occurred. More capital than in the 87, 92 period. Capital that could be used to accommodate future loss. Citibank, in many cases, was identified as the most viable bank in the world because it had diverse earning streams from all over the world. There were published documents that said Citibank had the most diverse, well-capitalized financial system in the world. The chairman of the FDIC openly said, the banking system has huge amounts of capital. By 2008, 12 months later, by 2008, the financial markets of the United States were undercapitalized. And we all know that Citibank was forced to take capital, TARP, from the government. The speed with which value was lost, the speed with which capital was lost, was greatly driven by badly written accounting rules. Now people say, oh, come on, you're blaming accounting. How's it possible? They were bad decisions. They were greedy people. They, they really did all these bad things. Bad things were done. Decisions were made that were not good decisions. But in actuality, the actual consequence of the accounting rules was never fully understood by the accountants who wrote them. We have rules, rules, that are taking hundreds of billions of dollars of capital out of the system that have been rewritten four times. They haven't put the money back. They've acknowledged that the rules are wrong. They haven't put the money back. They, in fact, realize that the interpretation results in fully informed, intelligent people coming to different decisions. I'll give you an example. First off, I want to say this. The chairman of PwC publicly on television said, 
Over the last several years, we've been transitioning from stability to visibility. He said this as a positive. He said this as an assertion that we were creating a better marketplace for investors. When I spoke to the chairman of the FASB about the consequences of what was going on and why there was a need for them to do something, he said to me, I hear from investors today who say they want more visibility. They want more of this accounting. And I said to him, I can assure you, you're not hearing from any investors who were investing in corporate America and lost 40% of their money. You're hearing from investors who made money as a result of the instability that you created. And who are those investors? Those investors are the shorts. And who are these people? These are people that have the ability to trade against the market capitalization of US companies. Companies can only spend market capitalization. The loss of market capitalization comes with a depreciation in value. In simple terms, if you look at the players in the marketplace, you have investors who invest in companies over time with a perception that that company will make more money and they'll have, the investor, will have more money in their 401k or more money as a result of making the investment. Against those investors, you have investors who explicitly invest in the likelihood that the stock will go down. Now, in a level playing field, this is just yet another example of a, not a level playing field. In a level playing field, everybody's playing by the same rules. Well, guess what? Here, right now, reality, there is no legitimate control over the shorts who do not have the same requirements of the longs. So the people that are investing in corporate America have reporting requirements, and there are reports filed every quarter where people can determine who's investing in what companies. It's required. It's a good thing. Visibility. However, in this environment, people who short stocks report nothing. They do it in the dark. Now there are laws that say you cannot naked short. What is a naked short? You sell a stock you don't even own. Now think about it. You or your pension fund invest 100 cents on the dollar. And you're in the same market where somebody else is selling the stock you just invested in with no money. No money on the line. The short only has to worry about the differential. If I sold it today, and I didn't own it, and I buy it back tomorrow for less, I make a lot of money. So how does a short get hurt if the value goes up? Why do we need to be concerned about tomorrow? Because the shorts are out of control. Not only do they not have a responsibility to report, but the clear, clear fact is that the regulatory bodies that are responsible for reporting illegal short trading cannot do so. Reality, the New York Stock Exchange, world renowned, where most of the major US companies are listed, the New York Stock Exchange cannot control the abuses of shorts. One very good reason, most of the stock that's traded in their listing companies isn't traded on the New York Stock Exchange. There were decisions made years ago. Those decisions explicitly said, in the favor of speed, we will sacrifice control. Contemplate. If a bank were to make such a decision, it'd be absurd. If the bank couldn't control the money in your account, wouldn't you be upset? Well, my God, the SEC and the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ can't control the legal trading in your investment in the equity markets. That should be a big, big problem. And why? Because in March, by example, 
The markets traded down aggressively, and everybody lost money excepting the shorts. The shorts make money as a result of the market cap of corporate America going down. They made money in huge volume trades on everybody that had liquidity, ultimately on every stock. Why did your 401k go down so far? Because there was a lot of money to be made on the differential between where the stock was and where the stock went. Why do we need to be concerned today? We need to be concerned today because the people responsible for controlling the market acknowledge they don't have control of the market. Why is that really bad? Because the people who are abusing the market know it. And they have previously made huge amounts of money doing exactly what I'm talking about. Now, a lot of appreciation has occurred most recently in the equity markets. Stocks are going up. Hey, that's great. Well, geez, you know, B of A just diluted their shareholders by issuing huge amounts of stock, meaning that they didn't have earnings to issue that stock. They issued that stock to accommodate having a sufficient amount of tangible capital to accommodate the losses that the future held. So think about what that means. That means that a very large, the largest, one of the largest US banks openly said, I'm going to lose more money than all of my earnings, all of my earnings in the future period, and I'm going to charge my capital. And in order to survive those charges, I need more capital. So I'm going to dilute you today, meaning I'm going to make the value of your investment in my company less today because I'm going to issue more stock to other people. I'm not going to increase my earnings necessarily, but I'm going to deal with my losses. Because when, when the 19, I was in Europe when this all came out, and the Europeans were investing wildly in US banks because, in fact, several of them were diluting their shareholders by issuing stock to put into capital. Didn't represent growth in the economy, didn't represent growth in earnings, represented acknowledgement that they were going to lose large amounts of money. Pretty cool, right? Stock went up. It wasn't just their stock. It was the entire market went up. Many other companies did the very same thing. And the values of stocks have been going up. The fundamental reasons, arguably, are that there is the capacity to increase earnings. In many cases, the earnings increases have nothing to do with volume of sales, has to do with how, in fact, various things are being accounted for in consolidations or in other changes that are being made. Important for us to know that the benefits derived by massive large shorts in March will be yet derived at a future date. And why? Because they can. You create an environment wherein large players can make lots of money by abusing a system that does not have controls, and you can be sure they will do it again. When will they do it? When they perceive the value has gone up sufficiently so there's enough money to be made taking the value down. So besides all of the other reasons with regard to the economy, we have an unlevel playing field wherein a major component of wealth creation or available money to be spent is in fact being abused on the downside, is in fact definitively capable of making money for people who are able to do that. Huge amounts of stock in these, in these black pools, or, or they're, they're called many different things, huge amounts of stock are traded in nanoseconds, nanoseconds. So we don't have block trading. 
we have a very small amount of block trading and a huge amount of systemic trading that avoids the operating rules of the system. So all blocks are reported. But if you trade, and, and, and in many cases, the numbers could be 10 times, 14 times, 15 times, the volumes of trade can greatly exceed the reported blocks, even though the volumes of trade have nothing to do with mom and pop buying or selling stock. They have to do with systemic trades that are so fast that they execute hundreds of thousands of shares of trade in small little trades that occur very, very, very quickly over long periods of time. Very bad for the system. The likelihood that something that is relevant to your future is being affected by what I'm talking about is extremely high. So the consequence of these things needs to be digested, understood by more people. You need to think about and talk about and potentially do something about what's going on around you. Because at no other time were there inherent risks to your future or the future of your children more relevant than they are today. Because the world is not going to wait for the United States to fix its problems. We, in fact, fueled a competitive world because we thought, or some people thought, that we would sell to the world. Well, reality is the world is selling to us. And if we're not able to fix our problems, the world will sell to each other, and we will lose value in the dollar, and we will lose our competitive position, and we will lose our quality of life. Not in specific timed measure, but over time with certainty. Our ability to compete is driven by our intelligence, by our flexibility, by good, stable rules. We're not creating the most intelligent people in the world. There are differences in numbers. There are large numbers of intelligent people in other nations. We sell education. It's a common practice. We sell the best education in the world to people who will come here and buy it. And then, based on rules, we send them home to compete with us. They want to stay. We say, no, no, go home and compete with us. So they taste what we have, they go home, and they create a situation where they can take what we have. Maybe, maybe that's not a fair assessment, but in many cases, it's very real. I know I'm in a college, and I know the door's over there. You know. <laughs> but this is not Yale. This is not you know, the colleges that got big checks you know, to do this. The reality is we have to assess who we are and what we do because it matters. We have to make decisions that are good long-term decisions. We can't just drive ourselves by immediate gratification. We need to have people that grasp what the risks are and how we best deal with those risks because we have real risks in front of us. And we need people who can grasp the risk and craft the solution. It was kind of nice when we could all go on with our lives and not care too much about who was making our decisions Unfortunately, too many bad decisions result in our having less quality in our lives. And unless we get more active in dealing with the issues of the day, and we need to understand the issues of the day, I fear that some of the negative things I've said today, you've never heard. You don't even believe. You can't even contemplate that some of these things could even conceivably be true. You think, what's that crazy kid doing? What, who's, oh, kid, being too kind to myself. Yeah, 
I've been, I've been at the same bank for 45 years. I can't even get out of my first job. <laughs> you know, the, the reality is when, when I was going to school, I was not contemplating doing anything like I'm doing today. But that's what is common. Most people who go to school, and realistically, young people are given an idea as to what it is they'd like to be. And it's because they saw something on television or they had an aunt or an uncle who did something that they thought was pretty cool or, or they, they developed a perception of what would be a nice place to spend the rest of my life. The vast majority of people do not do what they were educated to do. Another unfortunate reality in the United States, we create, we create, and this is a bad thing, we create debt for our children before they have the ability to pay. Student loans, what a bad concept. Student loans, you have to educate the children, but you shouldn't be giving them a loan that they have no capacity to pay. How many young people graduate? 87%, 87% of last graduating class did not get jobs, did not get jobs as they expected in the career that they had chosen. Big difference between working in McDonald's and working where you thought you were gonna work. And by the way, the loan doesn't get paid from the revenue you produce in McDonald's. This is not something that is hypothetical. This is everyday reality. When, when you think about a willingness for a person to take on debt that they can't repay, and then realize that for the last 10 years, they've been in debt because the government said, we're gonna give you a loan, which in many, many cases never gets paid or otherwise burdens the young people. I mean, young people ultimately marry, have children, have needs and they have this debt hanging over them, why do we create such an environment? We pay for children to go to school from kindergarten through the 12th grade. Don't we realize that people need further education to be capable to compete in the world? The world has become a smaller place. What does that mean? That means we compete. We bought systems a couple of years back. We bought a brand new system, US-based programs. We bought the system, and we had a meeting with the people that had to service the system. All the people that had to service the system came from India. And I sat there and I said, I don't understand. You're selling me this system, and you're telling me that it has failed in application in major banks around the country. It's a great system, but you don't have the people who can actually tie the system to the bank. And the answer was, absolutely. The only people that we can recommend are the people in this firm, which in fact comes from India. Now, that's good for the educational systems in India. That's bad for jobs in the United States. That's a bad reality that even in the creation of new systems, we don't have adequate capacity to service the systems we create. We're not talking about a car, we're talking about software. I mean, there are lots of reasons why, as a people, we need to recognize that an intelligent, competitive society is more likely to win against other societies they compete with. We need to educate our people. We don't need to put our people into debt. We don't need to do things that are irrational. We need to do things that are survivable. And in an evolving world where other people, and this has gone through the millennium, whenever one group of people has more than the rest, ultimately the rest want what you have, and they figure out how to get it, unless you're smart enough to figure out how to keep it. And, and when you think of the advantages we've had as a people over the last 
50 years, those advantages are being depleted by the ways in which we're preparing ourselves to deal with the necessary competition that we're fostering. The speed with which change is occurring is unprecedented. This change is not necessarily good. There are no guarantees. You have to earn every day the right to be at the top. You shouldn't take it for granted. You need to work at doing whatever is discernible and right. Because if you don't, we'll all be plagued by the consequence. And, and I'm sure you're all aware that the changes that have occurred in 12 months are dramatic. The bad news, look at the cycle from 87 to 92. Look at what happened, devaluation of many, many different businesses, many, many different uh, components of our economy. It was severe. That cycle was actually dealing with a three to four year positive cycle. It was a five year negative cycle. We've now had a 12 to 15 year positive cycle with the most fraud ever, with world funding of the appreciated values of our equity markets and our real estate markets. The adjustment, therefore, is gonna be huge. The time over which it will adjust will be long. That's just the cycle. That's not today's headline. Every day you turn on the television or you read the newspaper and somebody's telling you, here's the good news or here's the bad news. It's not a daily event, it's an overtime event. The realities that we're dealing with are serious. The consequences of the change we face are in fact going to be material. We have to make overtime decisions that are good decisions to deal with the reality of what we're dealing with. We need a public media that understands it and talks about it. Why do we need the media? Because the media is what creates the awareness of our populace. If people don't know what's going on, they just fear what's tomorrow going to bring. And fear and instability are all bad. You need stability. This concept of visibility is a very bad concept. When fully informed accountants come to totally different views, we had a recent situation where one of the new rules, as written, was interpreted by a major accounting firm, and they said, even though there is no economic loss, this is dealing with the downturn of Lehman, even though there is no economic loss, there were 355 swaps that had to be reset. So under 133, there were rules. How do you account for that? The accounting firm took seven weeks to finally decide how to account for it. They decided that it was a $64 million loss. We paid no money to anybody. It wasn't our bank. We paid no money to anybody. When it went to Washington, where the chief accountant who regulated the entity looked at it, they said it was a $200 million gain. The difference, $264 million. The economic consequence was near non-existence. The fact is, whichever choice was made, $200 million gain distorts the quarter in which it's reported. It's visible. Distorts the quarter in which it reported. $200 million gain had to be reversed in the next four quarters, which meant that for four quarters there was a $50 million charge. Now think about that. Is that visibility or is that stupidity? We're not reflecting the business, we're reflecting the perception of accounting for the business. And we're distorting the numbers meaningfully for five consecutive quarters. That's not accounting. That's unfortunate. And that's what we're plagued with. Questions? Yes, please. Oh. Our students, I hope 
you are really enjoying this and uh, understanding. The one thing I want to say before I open up to questions, and maybe we could just get the microphone over there. We want to thank you because it's, it's more than sobering. But uh, just in our small corner here at York, this is why our restructuring into the School of Business and Information Systems is important. Because as we've done that, we've developed two new departments, accounting and finance, business and economics. And we've added five new faculty in this area this year to give us the uh, engine, if you will, to sort of help to begin to meet some of the challenges that you've made transparent here today. And so, um, you know, it's sobering, absolutely sobering when you look at it at that macro level. Yeah. And we're glad to have you to provide that to us. And I'm just happy that looking at my little island, if you will, the small level, we uh, feel as if we're beginning to prepare uh, to build, to prepare in the kind of thoughtful, deep way that you suggest we need to. So we really thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So I really appreciate um, you being here because I really got some perspective. I have many questions here, but sure. I'm limited to one. Um, we can do one now and a few many later. later. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so uh, my issue comes back to when uh, Mr. Parson was the um, was the, the the secretary of the treasury and um, what took place in that debacle with Bear Stearns and how the, 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 in my eyes, the unfair treatment as it related to them compared to Goldman Sachs. Um, I believe that the fallout started from there. Um, even though there was evidence, evidences that it did occur prior, started prior to that. Um, the, the thing that I just want to also mention is the fact that I see a movement from the, 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 the businesses into government, and it asks, then it begs the question, where is the, um, um, can, can good decisions be made if there is a combination or there appears to be um, a, 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 a good old boy network in terms of running off our financial markets? I just want to get your perspective. I, I, I would say uh, right off, I agree with what you said about Bear Stearns. And with regard to government's involvement in the private sector, broadly, there is no historical evidence that government creates more economic value than the private sector of the United States of America. There is absolute certainty that we do and compete better as a free economic society. Government does not spend money well. Government takes money out of the system and then redistributes that money. Now, I'm going to just touch upon for a moment TARP. TARP perceived as a bailout. No one got a bailout. Everyone that got TARP lost a fortune. Everyone that got TARP either virtually economically went out of business or ultimately will go out of business. TARP is not a bailout. When TARP was actually created, the Congress of the United States and the administration, and everybody knows that there was no harmony between the administration and the Congress. In one weekend, the Fed and the Treasury went to the Congress and convinced them that they had to do something. Reality, they didn't really know what to do. What they knew was, they had to do something meaningful 
because we were on the verge of the entire world markets freezing. Reality. In that weekend, responsible leaders were told, we only have 27 days of food in the United States. What in the world are you talking about? Without the ability to literally move money, if the markets froze, they were discussing that the American people couldn't even be fed because the food couldn't be moved. They were talking about a battalion, a battalion, a U.S. battalion of soldiers available to protect the center of U.S. government. That's pretty severe. That wasn't in the headlines, but that was in their decision. And magically, they decided that in unison, they were going to do what Paulson asked for. And then in the time that passed, it was changed, what he had asked for. And it became perceived not as a solution of the problem it solved, but it became perceived as a wrong structured bailout of bad players. The perception is no one was bailed out, excepting, you know, possibly, I, I shouldn't say no one was bailed out. Let, let's, let's talk about Goldman. No, no secrets here. The chairman of Goldman was Paulson. No question, Goldman was at the table in many of the discussions with regard to entities that received government money that saved Goldman. Goldman did not lose on the assets that were in fact covered at AIG. So, and, and there are many other components of this, but the reality is that the taxpayer to date, in many cases with regard to banks, didn't lose anything. Goldman paid back the treasury, the TARP they received with approximately 19% appreciation. There are no short-term investments that return 19%. When, when we were offered, we were offered TARP. We read the agreement, and the agreement had sections that if our board were to agree to do those things with any other corporate entity, our board would be arrested. Because basically, it was an agreement that said, you are obligated to the terms of this agreement but we, the government, tell you that we have the right to change the agreement without changing your obligation. Now, you can't do business that way, excepting the government felt fully empowered to write the document that way, and everybody who took top took it under those, those terms. Everybody that took top lost money on top. All the repayments of top have been beneficial to the government, to the American people. All the repayments of TARP have in fact been a detriment to those who repaid TARP. That's not perceived. Anybody that has TARP because they're in fact going out of business, remember these are all public companies. Not only are there chief executive officers, who God forbid you tell your child to go to school and say my dad is a chief executive officer, but, but the bottom line is the employees of most of those companies had stock. The stock is worth zero or something close to zero. Is that a bailout? The company is either out of business or not, but the, the viability of what was a career. There are people that worked for Lehman for 35 years that had all of their money invested in Lehman. They lost it all. Of course, they weren't bailed out. But, but the concept of too big to fail, a major concept, that needs to be addressed, not by addressing changes in the existing system. There needs to be the, the new system put in place to ensure that we have a level playing field. I was talking about equities. Look at the way we lend. 60 to 65% of the loans that were created in the last five years were not created by regulated entities. That's absurd. The consequence of that is the harm that exists. No 
way we can avoid reality. We have had a system that is broken because the big components of the system are not viable. But anyway, I, I would answer your question and certainly I'd answer your questions later. I think, I think to the extent that, that your $5 you know, goes to the bank and then gets put back into circulation, uh, that's true, accepting that, that people putting money into the bank results in the bank doing a loan, which represents a fraction of the previously available funding. So remember, the problem if the bank was 40% of the available funding in the market and the bank gets your deposit, so now the banks have 5% more that they can put into the market. And by the way, most banks are lending more money. The restraint on lending more money is the requirement of capital. So it's counter-cyclical. At the worst of times, banks are building capital which means they are not lending as much as otherwise they would lend. Your point, valid, if you give the money to the bank, the bank invests the money or uses it to help capitalize their institution. But if the marketplace was getting most of its money from conduits, from structured debt that wasn't bank-based, and it represented 60% of the funding, and this is one of the reasons why New York is going to have massive losses. The largest transaction done in New York was a $5.4 billion loan on Stuyvesant Town, Cooper Village. That loss alone will be 2.3 to 2.8 billion billion dollars. Who is going to bear the loss? It's not going to be Tishman or BlackRock. They will have a small piece of the loss. Who ultimately holds the paper? You can be sure that those losses are all over the world. You could be sure that some of those losses found their way into your pension fund or into your 401k. So your point is valid that by depositing money, you're providing a increasing source of investment by banks but it's a small comparative change. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank our speaker. We have to invite you back. We really have to invite you back because this is an ongoing conversation. Thank you so much. And please accept thank you. this for, for up from us. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for and, you know, Joe will be around for questions afterwards. Students, if you want to get over here or other people who are here, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, this is a topic that requires, uh, this is a marathon topic, not a sprint. Uh, we may be able to invite him back, but I do want to thank you so much, invite you to some of the events that are coming up, the Lynn Nottage event tonight, uh, tonight also our aviation students, and then I'm not sure what this, other, oh, that, that's the H1, that's the H1N1, that, that happened. Monday, so I do want to invite you to those. I do also want to invite you to take what's on the table, not only food, but the flyers around the PAC, and of course, our envelope uh, that you may see there. Uh, at this time of the year, many of you are giving to your favorite charities, and we do have an annual fund here at York. We would like you to consider us among your favorite charities. It's for a good cause. Thanks again, and I enjoy the rest of your day.